mean, that's destroying my life. No respect. I don't get no respect at all. You're kidding. You're kidding. No respect at all. Well, when I was born, the doctor told my mother I did all I could, but he pulled through anyway, you know? I mean, I don't get no respect from anyone. Well, last week, my house was on fire. My wife told the kids, be quiet, you wake up daddy. You don't have to love me, but you will respect me. Guess what the message is on today? Well, it's good to see you here uh, this morning. It's been great. Uh, had a chance, chance not only to preach here in the first hour, but go over to the East Campus as well. And over in the East Campus, by the way, Doug Osborne uh, will be coming next week in view of a call. We'll be uh, hearing, they'll be hearing him over in the East Campus as a new, uh, potential new uh, East Campus pastor. He and Sonia have not only met us, but our staff and also the committee, and we're really thrilled that he's here. You'll hear a testimony from him uh, next week, and we're also going to vote on that as well. But enough about that. Uh, we'll just go later. Let me just say that before I get into the message this morning, uh, we just got back from uh, our Alaskan cruise, and thank you so much as a church that you gave us for that, for, gave us that for our 25th anniversary. And um, we really enjoyed ourselves. It was very relaxing. Uh, you know, and so also I ate a lot. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, I found out what gluttony I think is all about. I mean, I ate, I ate a lot. I mean, I got fat, fatter. Somebody asked me, how fat did I get? Well, I was standing on the corner in Juneau by myself and the police officer came along and said, y'all break it up. So anyway, that's, uh, that's my story. But it was great. Uh, and uh, great there, but it's great to be back here. And I do want to preach on respect. You know, what you just saw just a few moments ago on the video, the, the song Respect, Aretha Franklin sang that many years ago. And uh, it was written actually by Otis Redding about his own uh, respect and, and yearning for respect. And then, of course, Rodney Dangerfield, the comedian. How many of you remember, even remember him? I mean, it's been a long time. Made a whole career out of not getting any respect. And how many times in a movie, on TV, or you've said it yourself, some, some man will look at one of his kids and say, you may not love me, but you're going to respect me. What would cause a man to say, I'd rather be respected than loved? Well, according to many psychologists, and I think according to the Bible, certainly as well, but um, Emerson Egridge, Egridge a Christian psychologist, said the number one need of a man is simply respect. And sometimes we just can't really uh, grasp that or understand that since all of us need love. Now, he would say that women need respect as well, but they would lean on the side big, big time on wanting love and thinking about unconditional love, while men, on the other hand, about respect. Now, as we open up the Bible here on Father's Day in Ephesians chapter 5, we've been over Ephesians chapter 5 uh, several times, including, I think, last February one time in a series on marriage. But I want to look at beginning of verse 31, because I think there's three or four things here that we can un need to understand about respect and a man's need for, for respect. In fact, I want to look at this passage in four points. Number one is that respect must be given. And that's really the bulk of the passage. But secondly, respect should be, should be earned. A certain amount of it. Thirdly, if you respect, you will demonstrate it. And number, number four, really, respect can't be demanded. And I would put it in another way and say respect doesn't need to be worshipped. So let's get into the passage beginning in verse 31. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. The mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. A lot there. No question about it. But I want to zero in on this one aspect of respect here on Father's Day. And first of all, we've said that respect must be given. Well, setting up this passage is that Paul, first three chapters of Ephesians, is talking about doctrine, talking about beliefs, 
chapters four through six, the last three chapters, he's talking about the duty of it, the application of the first three chapters. In chapter five, verse 18, he says, don't be drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the spirit. So then he begins to talk about the spirit-filled life and what happens in the spirit-filled life, that you have a, a, a obedient heart, a, a heart of praise, a heart of worship, and a heart of uh, joy in your life and submission in your life. And then he begins to get into the family. And he's saying that this is an example of the spirit-filled life, but also he compares all throughout this passage the, the family with the church. Now, to set that up, he begins then to conclude his argument. And he says, first of all, he says, the wives see that she respects her husband. Now, let's look at this passage a little bit closer. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. He's talking about marriage here. He's talking about a couple getting together and becoming one flesh physically, but also emotionally and mentally. The mystery is profound. I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Again, this passage is just as much, just as much, at least just as much, about the church and how the church needs to operate as the family. Then he concludes, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself. He repeats that, by the way. It's the third time he's basically said that in this passage. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. Well, the word respect here, I'm very surprised about this word in the original Greek language that the Bible was written in. And it comes from our word meaning phobia. And of course, when you think about phobia, you think about certain fears in your life. So it says that she should fear her husband. Now, several weeks ago, we were in the book of Proverbs, uh, one, one time at least, one sermon, and we were talking about wisdom. And we said that the beginning of wisdom was the fear of God. But sometimes we confuse that knowing that in the Bible, or not knowing, in the Bible, there are two different types of fears. One, of course, is to be afraid of something. But the other one is to reverence something. Reverence to a point that you don't want to disappoint someone else. It's like uh, the, the story of the young girl that's being tempted and the young man's trying to tempt her. And she, he says, finally, look, you don't want to do anything just because you're afraid your father's going to hurt you. And she says, oh, no, I'm not afraid my father's going to hurt me. I'm afraid I'm going to hurt my father. Because she loved her father so much, she didn't want to disappoint him. She didn't want to hurt him. This is the kind of reference this is. We don't, we, we don't, we're not afraid of God necessarily. We are saying simply as a believer in Christ, I don't want to disappoint God. I reverence God so much. I love him so much that I, I want to please him. Well, that's the idea here in the scripture. It's a, it's a positive thing, positive fear, not a negative one. So what is Paul really talking about here? He's talking about a concept that we very seldom, if ever, think about. And that is unconditional respect. See, he's contrasting love and respect all throughout the passage and the different roles that we play within the home. Now, when we think about love, we're not surprised when the pastor would get up and say, we ought to love one another unconditionally. In fact, this word, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, is the word agape uh, in the Greek, agapeo, which means to love without reservation, love unconditional with a God's type of love. And so we understand that. We, we hear that in, uh, on television. We hear that in songs on the radio. We see that in movies that women want to be just loved for who they are and loved unconditionally by their husbands. But one thing we don't think about is that on the flip side, that we need to love the husband and the father also unconditionally. This means without reservation, without demanding anything, without even them earning any of that respect. Egridge would say this. He says, what happens in the marriage is that we believe in unconditional love and we've been conditioned to believe that. We have not been conditioned to believe in unconditional respect. And so the man needs to love his wife and love his children without reservation and unrestricted and unconditionally. However, he's got to earn the respect. That's basically how it kind of works in our society and in cultures all over the world, really. So you earn the respect. So that makes the man, he says, responsible for both the love and respect in the marriage. And no wonder he begins to shut down. 
And so the Bible teaches the idea of an unconditional respect. Now, the reason why, one of the things, not the reason, I don't know the reason why God placed that within us, that we would want to be honored and respected even among uh, uh, love. But you need to understand that men begin below the line of, uh, of below sea level, you might say. Mark Twain has said, no man respects himself. And I would think that would be pretty much true. Men know themselves, they know their own heart, and they fight at work, and they fight at home, and everywhere they go to gain honor and respect. It's been said that men have an honor code. They, they illustrate that a lot of times by in war, when you're fighting in war, and I, I haven't had to do that myself, but I've talked to other people who have, and they said, you know, I'm not only fighting for my country, but I'm fighting for the guy next to me. The honor code there. And so with no man really respecting himself, he's looking at the respect and he's, he's get, wanting to get it. He's yearning to get it from other sources, from people that he loves, that he admires, or that he is uh, wanting to get their approval. It may be uh, young people, something at school, someone at school. It may be on your job. A lot of times men that don't get the respect at home get it on the job. They get it on the work. And therefore, uh, they, they sell themselves out to their, to their work more and more and become workaholics because that's where they're getting the kudos. That's where they're getting the respect in their life. And so we look at men and we've said before in Ephesians, it tells us that men are called to protect and pro provide. Protect and provide the main two things of a man in the home, and he needs respect for that. Well, not only wives, but also children. Look in verse uh, one. Children, obey your parents. Now, the word children, by the way, here is the word techna, which means any offspring within the home. It says obey, that's a much stronger word than submit. Submit's kind of an attitude, really. Obedience is an action. He says, for this is right, honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. And of course, he's referring back to the sixth commandment in Exodus among the big 10 that uh, God mentions in the Old Testament. So the sixth commandment, honor your father and your mother. He said, this is the first commandment with a promise that you're gonna live long on the earth. And he begins to talk about that in the next verse. And so he says to honor. Now what's the difference between respect and honor? Well, not much. It really almost comes from the same Greek word. But the best way I can put it in is this. Respect is an attitude. Honor is something we do because of the attitude. It's the action behind the attitude. And he says, the children ought to obey, that is, follow the instruction of your dad, and children ought to honor their father and mother. Why? Because it's right. If you want to be right with God, that's what you do. If you dishonor your parents, you cannot be right with God. God's, not, God's blessing and favor is not going to be upon your life if you continue to do that. But also for your protection. And uh, Ephesians 5.21 talks about submitting yourselves to one another in reverence for Christ. It sets up the passage with that, with that verse, submitting yourselves to one another. Now, God has placed in our life umbrellas of protection. He's, he's put structures in our life in order for us to be able to perform to the top, the top of our game, to the top of our life, and to be fulfilled in this life. And it, all of us really have some sort of authority over our life. Now, the Bible puts it kind of like this way. One guy put it this way, and I've shared this with you millions of times, I suppose, but uh, God's like an umbrella of protection to protect us from the, the outside forces of the world, uh, namely, you know, the, the darts, the wiles of the devil, all right? Then you have the husband, then you have the, the wife, and then you have the children. Now, here's what happens. First Samuel chapter 15 says this. In the Old Testament, when a king rebelled against God, this is what God said, for rebellion is a sin as of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. What's it talking about here? It's saying that rebellion is like witchcraft. What is witchcraft? It's practicing the occult. So when you practice the occult, what happens? You open yourself up to Satan. That's what you're doing. That's why you find a lot of people involved in the occult very strange. They've opened themselves up to Satan. So rebellion is like that. Why? Well, you have this umbrella of protection. It doesn't mean you won't be tempted. It doesn't mean that you won't have problems in this life. But you're as protected, really, as you can be in this life because you're under the structure of authority that God has placed over your life. You step out from that as a child. You're stepping out from that as a young person. 
And you're saying, look, I'm gonna do my own thing. I'm not gonna do what my, my mom and dad wants, want me to do, or I'll do it, but I, you know, I'm, I'm doing it on the outside, but I'm not doing it on the inside. And you begin to rebel, and you think to yourself, you're getting away with it, because why? Well, your, your parents don't know. They don't know about it. But God does know about it. And now you're opening yourself up, just like you were practicing witchcraft, the wiles of, the sa of Satan, more temptation, more bad stuff coming into your life. So God says, I want you to admire, respect, and obey and honor your parents, not only because it's right, because it's for your own protection. Then, I want you to notice, it is also rewarded. Verse three, it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. The quality of life is gonna be there, but the quantity of life may change as well. Now I know it's appointed once for man to die and after that the judgment, but God knows whether we're gonna rebel or not. He knows all the future. And so here you are rebelling against God or not rebelling, we'll say. You're under the authority of whatever God's placed over your life. In this case, in this passage, it's your parents. And because you're placed on the authority, you're not gonna be out here somewhere with the wiles of, of the devil, practicing things and addictions and other things in your life that you might be if you came out from under them, but that you wouldn't be if you were placed under their authority. Therefore, your life becomes shorter. So a quality of life as well as a quantity of life. So dear friends, please get, get this in our head, that respect is not only needed to the, to the dads, to the husbands, and even if it's not earned, it must be given. Otherwise, he's responsible for both the love and the respect in the home. And that's, that's a burden that God does not want him to bear. Now, the next point, the best thing to do is for uh, only the men to listen, all right? <clears throat> and that is respect should be, I didn't say it had to be, should be earned, should be. Look in verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Christ loved the church. Verse 28, in the same way, husbands love your wives as their own bodies. In verse um, 4 of chapter 6, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. There's duties here for the husband, for the, for the father, and he ought to step up to those duties. Now, let me, let me just share with you this way. And ladies, you can listen to this part. Um, ladies, no one, no, no lady in this church would say, look, I'm going to live the way I want to live. I'm going to do what I want to do. And my husband must love me anyway because the Bible says so. You don't want that kind of love. What you want is an unconditional love that says, look, I want my husband to love me because he loves me, because who I am, because uh, he has that affection for me, because he, he wants to sacrifice, because he wants to. But when I mess up, and you will, and we do, I want him to love me anyway. That's the kind of unconditional love that we're looking for. Well, the unconditional respect's the same way. Look, I don't want my wife to simply, and my kids to respect me just because, well, the Bible says it's just the right thing to do. If you, if you, don't, if you don't do this, then God's not gonna bless your life, so you better respect me even though I've earned none of it. No, we want to earn the respect, but we mess up, and we mess up a lot. And when we mess up, we want the unconditional respect anyway. We don't want to have to have, live by, by someone's expectations. It's one thing to have a desire in your life that your husband or father, you need your husband or father to do. It's another thing altogether to expect it. It changes the attitude altogether. If I desire it, when I get it, then I'm going to think to myself, well, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Wow, I'm kind of surprised. But if I expect it, that even when I get it, I'm not grateful. And when I don't get it, I'm upset. And so that's what unconditional respect we're talking about. And men do want to earn, men do want to respect themselves and they do want others to respect them as well. Listen to this little uh, poem I found in James, one of James Dobson's old books. Across the fields of yesterday, he sometimes comes to me, a little lad just back from play, the boy I used to be. He smiles at me so wistfully when once he's crept within. It is as though he had hoped to see the man I might have been. All of us want to be respected, and all of us want to earn that respect as much as we can. 
But it's tough because it's how we feel about ourselves. And it's tough because people are blaming us, really, for, for a lot of stuff. And moms, too. But they blame us. You know, the, you know, something happens in the house and, you know, all of a sudden you, you get the blame. I mean, after all, it is your responsibility, right? I mean, and you're, you're the one that holds the responsibility, so it's your fault. At work, everybody's looking to pass the buck of blame somewhere so that it lands up in your lap. And so you get blamed for things. You're, you're already going through mistakes and regrets in your life. How do you do that? Well, the Bible tells us only through Christ. You see, all these passages in the Bible always point to one thing. You can't do it. The, the bar is set so high, there's no way that you can do that by yourself. You must do it through Christ. But dear friends, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was raised again on the third day. We invite him into our heart and every single one of our mistakes and sins are forgiven. And when they're forgiven, the guilt goes away. When, when, the, when, when we're forgiven, we have that, that regret to go away. When we're forgiven and the Holy Spirit of God, Ephesians 5, 18, comes into our heart, we've got the power to live an honorable and respectful life. Still make mistakes. Still need to be given grace, but only through the power of Christ. Well, thirdly, respect will be demonstrated. If you have it, you say, well, you know, I don't respect my dad, but I, I mean, I don't show respect to my dad, uh, that's for sure, but nevertheless, I do respect him. No, if you have respect, it will be demonstrated. Look in verse 1 once again. Children, again, anyone in the home, obey, that is, follow the instructions, honor, an action of respect in our life. So how do wives honor their husband? Well, through admiration, for sure. To admire, and how do you do that? Well, you respect his decisions in your heart. You know, we don't like this whole idea of submission, and we don't like the whole idea of authority, particularly here in America, and particularly lately. I mean, it's getting more and more and more. We just kind of resent that. But listen, God puts structures in our life. You know, I, I have someone to answer to, and my staff has someone to answer to, but let me, let me put it to you this way. Let me, let me just illustrate it in this way. Um, vice president of a company. You're a vice president, we'll say, of a bank, and because you're a vice president, you have a lot of authority in the bank. And because you're a vice president, you make a lot of, you make a lot of decisions in the bank. You go to the board meetings, or you go to the staff meetings, and you have input. And maybe your president gives you all kinds of leeway to say what you want to say, when you want to say it, in the kind of temperament you want to say it with. But the whole time you're thinking, bless God, it's not my decision to make, it's his. I can say what I want to say, but the monkey is on his back. You know? And nobody's going to come back to me and say, why did you do that? No, they're going to come back to him. He's going to have to be responsible. I'm, I can give my input. I, I remember uh, working with someone, um, and, uh, you know, we, we say this uh, hypothetically. You're working on a, a person uh, in a committee, and, uh, man, they feel really strongly about something. Your church committee feel really strongly about something. And uh, as a pastor, you're sitting there listening to them, and, and and you're disagreeing with them, and the rest of the committee maybe is disagreeing, but boy, they are just so adamant about it. We have to do this. And so you, you just pause and say, okay, all right. You represent 2,000 people in the church, and whatever decision you make is going to affect the whole church, 2,000 people, and the whole future of the church. Are you willing to make that call? I tell you what they're going to say. No way. Man, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I don't want the monkey on. I don't want anybody to come back to me and say, what a bad decision that was. No, the leader has to make a decision and then live with his decisions. And so when we're talking about submission, we're not talking about not having input. We're not talking about being a doormat. We're saying that the monkey's not on your back. The monkey with the biggest decisions, the monkey's on the husband's back or the pastor's back or the, the CEO's back of, of a president of a company. Admiration, affection. There's a difference how men and women treat the whole sexual relationship. I know that women, you know, you be nice and everything like that, and everything builds up to that. But with a man, closeness is defined by that. Refusing his affections. But lastly, real quickly, joy. An unhappy wife 
is a public rebuke to her husband. And how you become unhappy? You become ungrateful. I would say the last thing is this. Ask your husband, how do I honor you? And I guarantee you he won't be able to tell you what, what he, he hasn't thought about it. But eventually he'll come back to you and say, here's how you can honor me. So wives, honor. Children, honor. How does a child honor? Well, ask them. Sometimes we honor our parents, particularly as a, an adult. We think we're honoring them, and we have no idea if we're really hitting the mark or not. Ask them. But certainly admiration, thanksgiving for what they've done in your life. How many of you have ever heard of Charles Stanley, Dr. Charles Stanley? He's a pastor of First Baptist Church of Atlanta, probably the most watched person on television history as far as preaching. His son, Andy Stanley, now pastors one of the largest, if not the largest church in America, and the North Point Church out of Atlanta, Georgia. And they have campuses all over, and they have 35, 40,000 people, I guess, coming by now. Andy, his son, Charles Stanley's son, wrote a book called Visioneering about 10, 15 years ago. And he wrote this in the jacket, the dedication page. This book is lovingly dedicated to my dad, Charles Stanley, on whose shoulders I've had the privilege to stand. It was from that vantage point that I caught a glimpse of what could be and should be in my life. Well, don't you know that Dr. Stanley cut that out of the book and framed it? What a compliment. Something that you never forget. Admiration, obedience, loyalty. Just being grateful. Do you know why, by the way, your dad used to tell you, when I was your age, you know, the good old, you know, don't you love hearing about the good old days? Man, I walked to school uphill both ways in the snow in the middle of Miami, and it was horrible. And you're thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, my I, I, I did the same thing. Well, when I was your age, I was the remote. <laughs> when I, we didn't have computers. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have, and I'm thinking, what am I doing? I'm just like my dad. Why am I doing that? Because our children show ingratitude. And when they show ingratitude and live a life of ingratitude, we want to show them how good they have it next to us. So if your parents do that, you just know you're not being as grateful as you need to be. So you show gratitude and good behavior. You know, it should, you know, I tell you what makes a dad proud. When he points out one of his sons or daughters and says to, to, to a friend, that's my son, that's my daughter. You can just tell they're oozing with pride. Why? Because they're living a life. They're living a life of honor. How do you give honor? Live a life of honor. But lastly, let me just say this. Respect cannot be demanded. It can't be worshipped. Notice what it says in verse 4. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. How do you do that? Well, you be angry yourself. It says, well, bring them up in the discipline, consistency, and the instruction of the Bible in the Lord. Don't provoke them to anger. You know, one of the things that I've discovered with my own kids, I suppose that I've had two or three times, really three times probably, with each one of my three children over the years, all during their teenage years, where I had a conflict with them. You say, well, only three? Really three. And all three of them, with every single one of them, had to do with one thing. Either they were disrespecting me or they were disrespecting their mother. And we went at it. And I never realized during that time, that's different, you know, disrespecting your mom. You, you can't let them get away with that. And you can't let them get, get away with disciplining uh, or disrespecting you. But you don't have to get mad about it. Why did I get mad about it? Why did I, why did I get angry about it? Why did I get right back in their face like they were getting in mine? Because respect was something too important to me. Something within me would say, I can't believe they're, you know, after all I've done for them, and here's how they're treating me, and here's how they're, they're yelling at me. How dare they do that? I was putting respect kind of on the throne of my life and saying, this is really important to me without even knowing it. You can't demand it. 
if you demand it, if you worship it, then what, what happens? What happens is you provoke your children to anger. And you say, well, pastor, let me say this. Just cut, cut you off right now because you're asking me to honor my parents when they are just not honorable. In fact, I can think of all the bad things they did. And I know some of you are in that shape. I know that some of you are having to deal with that. But let me just say this. I, I had someone to talk to me. It wasn't a counseling situation. By the way, we we're just talking. And he shared with me how one of his parents had passed away. And it says, really weird, he said, you know, I, I never thought about this before. I never even thought about it. But during the funeral, all these bad thoughts started coming to my mind. And I remember some of the, the negative things and some of the things they, they said or actions. And, and, and I just got a little bit, a bit upset about it. And I can't get it out of my mind. I, I keep thinking about it. And I... I didn't know what to say. I didn't have my counseling hat on, you know, or anything like that. But God just sort of spoke to me, and I just asked him a question. I said, well, let me ask you this. Um, do you remember any of your, your, your friend's parents? Can you think about them? And he said, yeah, I remember them. I said, well, think about them for just a moment. Don't think about those TV parents, you know, those perfect parents on television. Think about the parents whose homes you stayed in to spend the night with your friends. He said, okay, I got it. I, I, I can name my friends. I got them. I said, well, let me ask you this. Would you, would you swap out your parents for one of them, one of their parents? He thought for a minute. He said, no. I said, don't say that because you love your parents. No, I, I'm saying, would you would have been better off as a child growing up and a better off as an adult if you would exchange parents with somebody else? And he says, no, I would not. I said, well, it seems like to me that, yeah, you have some bones to pick maybe. You, you have some negative things that have happened. But it also seems like to me you are a lot better off than what you think you are off. And I know that some of you can't say that. And if you can't, then there's something wrong maybe with the thanksgiving in your own heart or something wrong with your parents that they really didn't deserve that kind of respect. But let me just say this. The Bible says give it to them anyway. Just give it to them anyway. Let me close with this story. Um, as a teenager, my sister, um, I was a teen very young, she got married and um, was married for a long time, this, this guy. And... Um, Nice guy. I mean, I enjoyed him being my brother-in-law, but uh, they had a couple of kids, and uh, my wife and I moved off to Texas to go to school and, and different things where we were moving around, and one day we heard that they were getting a divorce, and he had done some hurtful things. And uh, later, because of everything that was going on, the family did some, kind of said some hurtful things about the family as well. And so I didn't see him for a long time. I, I saw him at a his daughter's wedding, I, I performed the ceremony. I didn't have a lot to say to him. I didn't want to look, it just happened. I didn't want to look like I was siding with him over against my sister, so I just stayed out as I should have. But until my mother's death, I hadn't seen him at all. And he, he looked pretty, pretty, pretty rough. I've been through a lot. This last summer I found out, this past summer, last year, I found out that he was dying of cancer. And my sister had long gotten over it, got remarried a few years, several years later to a great guy, wonderful, wonderful man, good friend. And uh, so she's doing well, thank God. But she told me, she said, yeah, he, he's, he's got cancer. He's only got a few months to live. And she'd gotten over him, but she had two children that were grieving over this. And so, you know, I, I said, well, I'll be praying for him. And I, I went out the driveway, headed back here. And something just told me, he said, you know, you need to go by and talk to him to see whether he's really saved or not because I'd led him to the Lord years before. And, and secondly, just to thank him for being a good brother-in-law. I said, God, you know, you, you, it, this can't be you. It must be the devil talking to me, you know. You ever had that? must be the devil. But I, I found myself going that direction. I said, well, I'm going to go that direction just be." He, he may be living in the same place, and God may be speaking to me here. So just in case, I'll head that direction. So I went that direction, went up and down the road a couple of times, wondering if I should even do this. 
Finally pulled in the driveway, knocked on the door, no answer, knocked on it again, no answer. Went back to my car. Before I got to the car, he came out. And I turned around and barely recognized him. And he invited me to come in, not knowing why I was there. And we exchanged a few pleasantries. And then I said, you know, look, I, <clears throat> and I did find out uh, later in the conversation about his assurance of salvation. He said he got right with God, so he was ready to go. But in the midst of the conversation, I said, look, one of the reasons, I, I guess the main reason I came here, I just wanted to see you face to face one more time and thank you for being such a good brother-in-law to me. He was very surprised. I had prayer with him, and uh, first time I'd seen him ever cry. But during the last few months of his life, he told both of his sons, both the son and daughter, how much that meant to him and went over what I said. You know, I, I had a warning there. I, I didn't know he was going to die until I went back home or back to my parents' house last summer. Some of us don't have that warning. <clears throat> Some of us may lose our dad or our mom or another loved one without any warning at all, without ever saying to them how much they meant to us. Wouldn't it be something for you to call <clears throat> your dad this afternoon if he's still living? Just say, instead of say, Dad, ha happy Father's Day. What's going on? Say, Dad, happy Father's Day. I just wanted to call and thank you for being such a good dad to me. Thank you, thank you for teaching me the right things. Thank you for going to the ball field with me, for playing ball. Thank you for making a living so I could go to college. I just want to thank you for being the dad that you are. That would mean quite a lot, wouldn't it? What an honor that would be. And as we sit here this morning, I challenge you to do that. But we sit here this morning, we, we understand that there's just a lot of struggle going on. Because some of you would think, my dad has hurt me so much. Well, my brother-in-law kind of hurt me. I was very disappointed. But it's worse with the dad. And only by the grace of God can you bring yourself to the point of just forgiving and letting it go. You see, everywhere in the Bible that we read, we read something that's impossible to do on our own. Why? Why is the bar so high? To help us to realize we need Jesus in everything that we do. And if you've never received Christ into your life, we had 64 kids this past, year, this, this past week, 22 others on Friday night commencement, probably adults, give their hearts to Jesus Christ. And I would challenge you, if you've never done that, or if you're not sure that you've, you were to die today, you'd go to heaven, I challenge you to do that right now. With heads bowed, eyes closed, I just pray this prayer. And as I pray this prayer out loud, I just challenge you to pray this prayer with me silently. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and dying on the cross for me. Thank you for forgiving all my sins. And I need the power to forgive others as you have forgiven me. I need the power to live an honorable life. I need forgiveness of my sins and my shortcomings. And so I invite you into my heart, turning from my sins and asking you to become the Lord of my life, to put you on the throne of my heart. In Jesus' name, amen.